So go ahead and get a seat, and we'll get started here in just a moment. being with us today and for engaging in some question and answer after the sermon. We've had an opportunity for members of the congregation to submit questions in the weeks leading up to your visit. So um, this will be a, a selection of some of those, just like we did after the eight o'clock. Excellent. Um, I wonder if we could jump in, maybe starting with your, your sermon. And I love this line that you had in your sermon um, about that we're called not to build the kingdom of the church but the kingdom of God. Um, could you unpack what is the difference between those two things and why are you putting the stress on the latter? So I, d I don't know if you guys have heard, but the Episcopal Church is shrinking. <laughs> and we have been shrinking for about the last 40 years. In fact, most mainline uh, denominations have been shrinking. And so what that has led to in a lot of cases is folks sort of like, being concerned about preserving their church as they know it, as if the goal of church is to perpetuate our existence. And for me, that's, that's not what we're called to. We're not, we weren't, weren't called to sort of, you know, build church. We were, we were called to proclaim the kingdom of God, to build the kingdom of God in the here and now. And so I, I say that because I want people to be reminded that the goal of church is not our self-preservation. It's not the existence of church. The goal of church is to be a community whereby people's lives are transformed and people are, are called into deeper relationship with God and one another and then called to be a part of the reconciliation and healing of the world. And so, you know, I, I, I always say, you know, there's this guy who said those who just want to save their life will lose it. But those who are willing to lose their lives for the sake of the gospel. And, and I think that it goes to a lot of things, you know, to lose the life as we know it. To lose, you know, our idea of what church should be like. To, to let go of, of the things that we cling to so that God can fill us with what we need to go through this phase of life. To live in this time, in this place, and, and how we proclaim the gospel that way. And so I say that, that it's one of my many mantras, but it's, it's one of the mantras that I really believe we, we have to be more concerned about the brokenness of our world than we are about the preservation of church as we know it. Mm. So. And, and maybe to continue on that line, you've talked about the church moving from a field of dreams model to the Good Samaritan model of church. Can you what, what's the first one? What's the second one? And why are you trying to push us into that, that second direction? So the field of dreams, I, you know, if you you've saw the movie, I know I'm old. So if you're a younger person, it might not be on your top 10 movie list. But there's this whole idea of like, if we build it, they will come, right? If we build it, they will come. And the reality is that that worked for a while for us as church. But the reality is we, we are living in an increasingly secular society, right? And people aren't going to come into our buildings because they don't know what they'll find. They don't know if they'll be safe. I mean, there's all of these things. And, you know, I tell people in the last two years, more folks have heard about the Episcopal Church than have heard in the last 10 to 20 because we've been places we haven't been before. We've been online. We've been on YouTube. We've been, you know, on TikTok. And, and you know, while... We don't have the fulsomeness of incarnational presence in those places. What those places do offer us is the opportunity to speak to people, to have people hear us pray with and for one another um, in, in ways that, that show forth kind of how we build relationship with God and with one another. And that's powerful. And so uh, Trisha Lyons, who, is, uh, who teaches at VTS, a good friend of mine, said, you know, the whole thing about Pentecost isn't that, you know, people learned our language. It's like the, peop the people of church, the apostles went out and learned the languages. They were given gifts to, for the languages of the people around them. And so in church right now, we're going to have to learn new languages. We're going to have to learn the language of technology and, you know, 
one of the blessings of COVID is that we were just kind of kicked off that map, right? We were like kicked into the fray. And, the, and I think um, we will be blessed by that. Um, my son, I was laughing, my 20-year-old who is in school on the West Coast, uh, I called him this past Easter, and I said, do you go to service? He said, no, but I did make my roommates listen to your Easter sermon <laughs> online. Um, and so if that's a way for us to, to be in touch and, and spread the good news, then, you know, that's the language we're going to have to learn and, and figuring out how to speak to those folks around us. So as you, as you think about those folks outside the walls of the church, the ever-growing numbers of the so-called non-done spiritual but not religious. One of the members of our vestry, Andy, asked, um, how do you describe the Episcopal Church in particular, or being a Christian, a follower of Jesus, to people outside the walls of the church that would, that would never darken the doorstep just because we built it, they won't be coming? How do you talk about being an Episcopal follower of Jesus to them? It's so funny. I, I get this question. I, I was mentioning to the early folks that my husband and I, as part of our, our ritual, we have date night every Sunday night, and we choose to go to a, a bar, usually a hipster one, so that we are the old folks in the room. And, and inevitably, in conversation, somebody goes, so what do you do? And I say, I am responsible for the care of about 20,000 souls. And they're like, what does that mean? <laughs> And I talk about, you know, I, I'm the bishop of the Episcopal Church in Colorado, and I always get, so, so what's, what's Episcopal? I said, well, basically it means you, you have a bishop. And they're like, so why did you, do you choose that church? And I always talk about, in the Episcopal Church, we have some of the best prayers, right? And I'm married to a Baptist, so it did take some convincing <laughs> that the prayer book was actually worthy because he was like, all these prayers, um, but I sat him down and I read him the prayer for the human family. And, and he looked at me and he said, that's beautiful. I'm like, uh-huh, it is. Um, and, and so I talk about, you know, as an Episcopalian, I, I have been called into relationship. That, that our, our, our focus is on being incarnational. That incarnation is, is a game changer, you know, it's that trophic cascade. And that we are called to be living members of Christ, like we are called to embody Christ, to, to incarnate Christ in ourselves in the world. And they were like, how do you do that? I'm like, with fear and trembling, always. Um, but I always talk about relationship. And I remember um, when I was a pastor of a parish, I, was, I preached a sermon and I had someone come up to me and he had left. Um, he, he had been a pastor in the Church of the Nazarene and he left. And he came up to me and he said, why haven't I heard this before? I said, what do you mean? And he said, about this God who is, because I talked about, it was Good Friday, and I said, our God is dying to be in relationship with us. Our God is willing to die to be connected to us. And he said, why, why, why haven't I heard that before? I was like, I don't know. What church you been going to? Um, but that, that, for me, I think that is a gift that we have, that that in our particular understanding of, of faith, God seeks relationship. God is being in relationship and seeks relationship with us and with creation. And, and I think it's different. I tell people it's different whether you have an understanding of God as a punitive judge or God as a loving parent who, who wants what's best for you, who wants to be in relationship, who wants you to grow up and get out of the house and get on with being who you're supposed to be. Um, you know, and, that, and that's just a, a different way of being in the world. This question comes from Michelle. Michelle gets here with her husband every Sunday at 6 o'clock, dragging uh, two little ones in tow. They're usually still in their pajamas and bringing in bagels with them um, at 6 o'clock. She, she's more faithful in bringing her kids to church than I am. Um, <laughs> how has motherhood changed you as a bishop? as a minister in God's church. Oh my goodness, I have to tell you this story. So um, I keep waiting for the moment for parenting to get easier. <laughs> and so far it hasn't at any stage. But I remember my oldest child was sort of going through it. He's about um, 15 and 
you know, he's driving us crazy. And he has an autoimmune disorder, so risky behaviors. You know, I would say, honey, most people have this much room to screw up. You have this much. Could you, could you not? <laughs> um, and I remember s expressing to a friend of mine, if only my children would just listen to me and do what I tell them, their lives would be so much easier. Amen. And my friend said, I wonder how many times a day God has that thought. <laughs> and that was just such like it was just this powerful thing because it is that I mean I, I don't want my children to stay children I want them to grow up I want them to have rich lives and, and I want to be in relationship with them um, and, and that's you know when I think about a God who creates us to be in relationship with us and how hard that is and how heartbreaking it is you know that that you know, when my children suffer, I suffer. And, and to, to realize that, that, you know, we, we proclaim an incarnate God that suffered on the cross for us, for us. Um, and, and so a, as a mom, you know, I, I think I've learned to rely a lot more on grace, right? Because grace is, grace is what happens. And, you know, being willing to, like, be there for my kids even when they screw up. You know, that's, that's to me, the God, you know, that's how the God mo that we serve models love. And did you say it doesn't get easier? No, right, I have a 20-year-old. I mean, I thought, okay, when they're teenagers, they'll need me less. Not true. They need you the same amount. They just resent that they need you. <laughs> and then, you know, they're an adult. You know, they, they still need advice and, and want to talk. And, and the problem is these problems can't be solved with a snack and a nap, right? But <laughs> it just, you know, maybe, maybe when they're 50, it'll be easier. I hope. She's shaking her head. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the cool things about the pandemic is that it's opened us up to new horizons. We're live streaming this right now. We've got people joining us all from throughout Denver Metro and beyond. Um, this question, though, comes from Skylar. Um, and he has a quote from Eugene Peterson's um, book, The Jesus Way, um, which is a book apparently I need to read. Um, let me read a, a bit of this chunk and, and then I'll pose the question to you. Um, we Americans are the world's champion consumers. This goes, goes along with your sermon today. So why shouldn't we have state-of-the-art consumer churches? Given the conditions prevailing in our culture, this is the best and most effective way that has ever been devised for large gatherings and prosperous congregations. Americans lead the world in showing how to do it. There's only one thing wrong. This is not the way which God brings us into conformity with the life of Jesus and sets us on the way of Jesus' salvation. This is not the way in which we become less and Jesus becomes more. This is not the way in which our sacrificed lives become available to others in justice and service. The cultivation of consumer spirituality is the antithesis of a sacrificial, deny yourself congregation. A consumer church is an antichrist church. Thoughts? Whew. First, I love Eugene Peterson. Uh, he's one of my, my favorite theologians. Um, second, I, I, I think we have gone this way of, of making our, our church folks consumers and not disciples, right? They're like, we've, we've sort of, back in the day, I just remember this thing, oh, we're church shopping. I'm like, you know, but church is not a, like shoes, right? It's, it's not, and I love shoes, I'll be the first to admit. Um, but church is about something more, and we talked earlier today in the other group that if we speak bad theology, we live it. And so, you know, I, I've stopped I, telling my kids, I was like, we don't go to church. We go to worship with church. We go to services. We go to gather with our fellow uh, kindred in Christ to be church, right? Um, and I... I posted on my Facebook feed a, a powerful argument uh, uh, written by someone who talks about people leaving church because they aren't connected mm. 
They don't have friends. They don't feel like anybody really cares about who they are and what pain they suffer. And that in order for that to happen, in order for true Christian friendship to happen in community, we have to be willing to be appropriately vulnerable with one another. We have to be able to be in the place where, you know, just a gentleman came up to me after church and said, I need you to pray for my daughter. She's struggling. And we all struggle, right? We all struggle. And to be able to be uh, a community where, where people can bring their pain and their brokenness and, and, and their not put togetherness um, is a powerful thing that, that's so countercultural to the world. I remember I was having a staff meeting, and one of the things that I often ask my staff is, What are you excited about? What are you struggling with? And we have that conversation, and one of the members of my st staff said their spouse was like, we would never do that in a corporate board meeting. You, you never talk about your struggles in the world. And, and I think that's sort of part of church community is, is for us to be a place where we can struggle. Um, and and the, the, the truth is, living the gospel isn't about what's shiny and new. I mean, I think there's some minimal safety thresholds that every church should consider uh, and take seriously but you know our our job is to build community not to to as my my husband he has lots of pithy quotes that I steal but he says you know if people in America expect church to make them feel good and absolve them of their exploitation and greed um, but that that's not our task is our task is to help one another lived transformed lives. So then more along those lines of living transformed lives and that difference that you've um, struck here between the consumer and uh, being a disciple. Christy, who helps to read, uh, lead up our outreach committee um, and, and really reach out beyond the walls of the church, um, asks, Christ Church is discerning a call to what we we're calling whole life discipleship. What does whole life discipleship mean to you in general? And specifically, what does it look like, sound like, and feel like to be a disciple of Christ in the Episcopal Church in Colorado in 2022? So uh, whole life discipleship means for me, um, I always say that, that whatever I do on Sunday is about equipping me for living my life the rest of the week. Whatever, whatever thing I do in worship is about equipping me in my relationships and my work and everything else that I do the rest of the week. And for me, um, I, I learned very early on, I was tutored by uh, some Dominican friars. And so I, I learned early on that I, I had to have a rule for my life. Like how, how was my life going to be shaped by my faith? And my rule is basically the Dominican rule of life and that is the rule of study of prayer, of proclamation, and service in community. And that, that I have to order my life in that way. So study, study scripture, study everything in the world. You know, I'm, I'm on that Paul thing, you know, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Learn as much as you can and, and figure out how that learning fits in with your life of faith. Prayer. I, I tell everybody, before my feet touch the floor in the morning, I give thanks that my, my first prayer of the day is thanksgiving to God. And that sort of sets, for me, the tenet of the day, that I've already been blessed by waking up and, and give thanks for that. I also have, you know, on my phone, every morning I get a new uh, piece of scripture to contemplate, and that sets my piece for the day. And then I think about how do I proclaim the gospel? Now, I, I do it in church on Sunday, but my call is to do that always, right? How, how am I proclaiming the gospel in the world always? And sometimes, you know, I've learned you, you can do it without thinking about it. I, uh, for instance, my car was in the shop, transmission things going on. So I'm going to get a loaner car, and one of the porters who sort of drives you over to your car was talking to me, um, and, you know, we got in a conversation, and, and he had told me that, you know, his marriage fell apart. <laughs> I don't know why people tell me these things. I, I just, he told me his marriage had fallen apart, and his car had broken down, and he was fortunate to get a job, and he'd gotten COVID, and he was in the hospital, and he lost, like, 30 pounds in two weeks, and um, 
I, I looked at him and said, my friend, the, that you are living and breathing and walking around is the testament to divine goodness, isn't it? And he just sort of paused and he looked at me and he just said, thank you so much for being here today, for, for giving me that word. Um, and that's, that's the kind of piece that, you know, I, was, I, I wasn't thinking about how can I be Christ for this person today. That's not what I was thinking. I was thinking, how can, how can I hear this person and hear their pain? And then the reality is that's what we're called to do and be as Christians, is to be present for people. Um, and so that's something I'm, I'm keenly aware of as, as I'm in the world. How do I model what it is I truly believe? Um, and, and being out in the world, I mean, there's, there's so much brokenness in the world. Even among those who think they have it all together. A couple weeks ago, I talked about uh, Chesley Christ, who committed suicide. I mean, she's like Miss USA. She was like going to be in like, you know, amazing law degree, you know, famous. I mean, and, and she, she threw herself off the balcony of her building. And I, and I wonder if it was because she had nowhere to say that she was lost, that she was suffering. And, and for me, I think you know, that's part of the call of church, is to, to, to build community, to be a place where we can be broken as we all are. I, I don't think you brought your crystal ball um, with you. I don't. <laughs> Um, and, and, and unfortunately, the miter does not convey any, like, you know, prognostication powers. It, it doesn't? Does not. Okay. Um, but Chenda, one of our, our digital members who joins us from Philadelphia, asked, um, how do you see the church evolving over the next 25 years? What will it look like 25 years from now? Oh, gosh. I, I, don't, I don't know what the church is going to look like next year, much less 25 years from now. But I was just at this conference uh, about what, what, hap what needs to shift in our structure for us to move forward. And um, one of the folks on our team, the Reverend Katie Green, is a priest up in Steamboat. And she said, you know, I was just thinking, as a skier... When you want to change directions, you don't have to get new skis. You don't have to do, you have to shift your weight, right? You have to be able to shift from your right hip to your left hip. And when you do that, you will shift directions. And it's so easy for kids to learn to ski because they're not afraid to shift their weight. They're not. My kids, my 14-year-old twins, never skied before we moved to Colorado. They've been skiing all of four times. They're already on the blue. They're already doing, you know, crazy stuff because they're kids, and they're not afraid to shift their weight. Mm -hmm. um, we sort of who have been a part of this large institution, it gets kind of heavy, you know. I get it. God, I'm a little heavier than I used to be. And you become a little more fearful about shifting, you know, shifting your weight. But, but that's, how you that's how you change your course. You shift. Um, and I think, you know, the Episcopal Church, we're, we're as old as this nation. <laughs> um, and it's, it's a hard sell to say to people, we have to shift our mindset. We have to shift our weight. We have to shift to, to live into this new reality. Now, I'm not ready for TikTok church, but that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Um, but at the same time, I want to hold on to some real key values, and one of them I, I got from my oldest child, who is now 20, um, who, who occasionally actually does go to church, even though he told me he's never going to darken the dorsal of the church again. Um, he, he said, you know, church has to be willing to hear the needs of the people outside of the church has to be willing to sort of shift our focus from, from being focused on, on whatever is going in, inside the walls to, to what's going on outside and, and, the, and the things that people are suffering. And, you know, I talk to folks and I, you know, folks who, who are teachers who are, are frustrated and, and feel like they, 
Everybody wants to do their job, but nobody really wants to do their job, right? <laughs> and now nobody really wants to, to pay them for the work that they do. I, I think there's just a lot of struggle. I've, I've talked to, to healthcare workers who are so burned out. I mean, they, they, go, they went into healthcare because they wanted to help people, and they're sick and tired of helping people. I mean, that, that's just, just a painful, painful place for me. Um, and so I think um, part of what we're going to have to do is to figure out how do we shift to address a world that doesn't just know about church but is suspicious of church. Um, and I don't know how we do that. But, you know, I, people are like, oh, but we're shrinking. And I'm like, yes, we are. And I, I say, if, if Jesus is your model for church, church growth, he really was kind of bad at it because, you know, he had all these crowds, you know, thousands of people come in. They, he was healing them. It was all good. And then he started asking them to change their life. And then he started talking to them about how real love involves sacrifice, real sacrifice, so that by the time he got to the cross, there were maybe five, five people there. But five people can change the world. Five people who are committed to, to, to living this way of love can change, can be that trophic change in the world. So. Jessica, another member of our vestry, asks, um, what has been difficult in the first years of your uh, episcopate professionally, and if you care to share personally, and what's helped you remain hopeful and faithful during these times? And what would you most like prayer for in this coming year? Um, the difficult part was, you know, I, I started my episcopacy. I was starting to get to know the, the Episcopal Church in Colorado, and then COVID happened. I had exactly one year, 12 months, of, of traveling around and meeting folks, and then COVID happened. And then I had to shift. I had to shift kind of how I communicate, how to sh shift how we do church, and there were all these decisions to be made, but I had to sort of go back and root myself in my own principles of leadership, and somebody else articulated them better than I can, and I'm, I'm totally stealing his words. He said, when you are committed to non-coercive, transparent, self-aware leadership, it takes a lot more energy to, to build relationship, but, but that's what I'm committed to. I am committed to non-coercive, transparent, self-aware leadership. And so um, making those decisions during COVID was for me about encouraging us all to use the gifts we have been given, God-given gifts, to make good decisions to take care of people. That was like my whole goal. How do, how do we make faithful decisions that take care of people? Um, not just our needs, but other folks' needs, because I think that's really part of what the gospel is about. And so that's going to be ongoing. I mean, I, like you, I kept thinking, oh, we're almost, we're almost, no. We're almost, no. Um, and so as I've read more research about the last pandemic that, uh, that started in 1918, uh, it, it took truly four years to recover four years to recover. And as I think about that and, and what it means for, for church, you know, I think it is probably an opportunity where we've sort of been shoved out of our comfort zone. And I think that's, that's really a holy place, you know, in that place where, where we're not quite sure what to do or we're not quite sure what's next in that, that liminal space, some call it. That's a holy place. And if, and if we're patient, um, our path will be revealed. I believe. And so for me, you know, I ask for, for your prayers for, for safety as I travel. I travel all over, and um, I always say there's no, like, cruise drive in Colorado. Every drive is a technical drive. It doesn't matter where you're going. Um, and I love it. I have the best commutes ever. Uh, but, I, but I pray for that. I, I, pray, I ask your prayers for um, my own ongoing discernment. Um, you know, I have to, I, I'm a big believer in that, that thing they say in the, on the airplane, you know, you got to make sure your oxygen mask is in place before you put somebody else's. 
Um, and, and that's a hard thing. I know that every church leader right now is exhausted. I mean, we're just all, we're all exhausted. And so I really ask your prayers for your, for your church leaders, clergy and lay, because it's been a, a hard time. And we've had COVID and, you know, I had COVID and a busted ligament. You, you had COVID and kids. You got COVID and cancer diagnoses. You, I mean, it, it just complicates and adds on to every other struggle we're going through. And so I really do ask your prayers for, for all church leaders right now because we, we are in that liminal space. And while I do believe it's holy, it is also challenging and tiring. Arthur uh, mentions that our presiding bishop has talked a lot about evangelism and evangelism matters. And um, w wondering what are your plans, ideas for creating and promoting an evangelism initiative in our diocese and within a parish like ours? And maybe could you just talk about what is your idea of evangelism, which is often a dirty word for a lot of For families. the Episcopal Church? Oh my goodness. Well, I'm really blessed. Uh, I have Canon Mike Orr, who's our canon for communication and evangelism. And um, I, I, will t I will tell this confession, Mike. Uh, when I first got here, Mike said, <clears throat> Bishop, I think it would be really great for you to like film a video every week. And I was like, uh, really? Okay, maybe I'll get to it. <laughs> and then COVID happened. Well, guess what? <laughs> I, I was recording a, 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 just a little message every week. And the, the power of that is, you know, and I asked him, I said, so what do you want me to talk about? He said, talk about your faith. Because we think evangelism is like this big, hard thing, right? That, you know, we, we have to like have a pamphlet and we have to have all the answers and we have to, but it's not. Every single one of us was evangelized by somebody. Somebody who showed us a way of life, a way of being in the world, a relationship of their faith that, that drew us. And so for me, evangelism is, is how do we tell our faith story? How, how do we tell that story? And I, I tell people, I am here in church because my college chaplain evangelized me with the, the, the gift of free pizza. <laughs> he did. And he invited me. I said, I don't go to church. He said, okay, don't come to the church service. Come to pizza afterwards. It starts at 6 o'clock. And what I didn't know when I showed up at 6 o'clock was the conversation was around Bible study, was around the scripture for the day, was around how, how we are in community together. And that was my reintroduction. But even before that, I tell everybody, Miss Jeter taught me like the val valuable lessons in Sunday school when I was like 10 years old. And the biggest lesson she taught me was that God is love. And that God is never far away from you. And that God will wait for you. And she was right. I mean, she was right. But that she planted those seeds for me. Well, that was, that was her, her way of, of evangelizing. And I think if we, we just tell those stories. Tell the story about how God worked in your life. Tell the story about how the Holy Spirit moved in your life. And it doesn't mean that your life has to be perfect, but that you have this awareness that, that there is more to this life than what this world tells us, that, that there is more love and there is more grace, and, and we've received it. We've received it. And so for me, evangelism is just reminding ourselves, reminding others that, that we chose this life because Jesus chose us. Maybe one more, and then we'll do a little rapid round to, sure. to finish up, if that's okay. Um, what's with the pointy hat and stick? Are you trying to, <laughs> they're like a Gandalf thing you're doing here, Lord of the Rings? Oh, I wish. You know, I wish the hat came with, like, special powers, right? Yeah. I wish it did, but it, it doesn't. Um, and I, I, I have to confess, when I was elected bishop, um, you know, they were like, oh, well, you need to get this, and you get to this, and I was like, oh, no, I don't want to think about that. But then a friend reminded me that we are a church for whom our symbols speak. Your, our symbols speak something, and, and so what do you want your symbols to say? And so for those of you who, who might have seen my uh, uh, vestments that I was consecrated in, I said, I want those vestments to say, 
I am a baptized child of God, and I am a servant of the Episcopal Church of Colorado. And that's why you have these, these white garments with water flowing down and a big old columbine on them. Um, because that's what I wanted my vestments to say. And so the symbols, that funny weird hat, and it is weird, I just have to say, it's weird to wear. But it is a reminder of, of the Holy Spirit. It's supposed to be the, to symbolize a flame of the Holy Spirit. And that's to remind me that in my leadership, I have to be led by the Spirit. I have to be willing to be led by the Spirit. And the, and the crozier is, is the, the crook of, the, of a shepherd. And that reminds me that, that in my leadership, my, my primary piece is to, to love and care for God's people, to be concerned about the lost, to, to care about the pain and suffering in people's lives. That's what that is. Um, I was laughing because I was telling Joseph earlier today, uh, Bishop Winterode asked if I wanted his cross and he, uh, his crozier, and he has this massive crozier with this hook. He's like, you can hook anybody with this thing. And I picked it up, and I was like, Bishop, this weighs like 5,000 pounds. How can you carry this around? So I, I'm content with, you know, my crozier, which is broken, but it still works right now. So, um, but, but those, the, the symbols that we have, you, it's not enough to just have the hat and the crozier. It's, it's to be constantly aware of what they symbolize, what, what, what they speak. And so that's... Was, did it break because you were beating some clergy over the head with it? No. Or <laughs> no. Just kind of that in there. No, I didn't. I wasn't, I wasn't clubbing any clergy. Okay, okay, good. Okay, rapid fire round to, to finish up. Um, what fashion trend um, have you followed that, that you did follow previously but now looks ridiculous? Um, Fashion trend in the past. Fashion trend. Oh, gosh. I had hammer pants. I don't know about you. You had hammer pants? Didn't yeah. You? I've tried to, tried to lose all those pictures. Um, um, I don't know. Cause, so I, I laugh because people were like, oh, you got cowboy boots. I have loved cowboy boots for the last 20 years of my life. I married my husband. His dad's from West Texas. He told me I couldn't be in the family if I didn't have boots or something. So, so I got cowboy boots so I wear that I've decided you can wear cowboy boots with almost anything <laughs> book that has dramatically influenced your life one one this is rapid round I think the Bible is the right answer <laughs> I mean I'm not sure it's church well definitely that <laughs> definitely that that's definitely influenced my life a lot gosh Oh, really good book. I highly recommend. It's called Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me. Um, and uh, it's, it's a whole thing about like confirmation bias. And, and it talks about how people don't really change unless there is, except through relationship and trauma. And I'm like, Jesus was an expert in confirmation, confirmation bias 2,000 years ago. Who knew? I highly recommend it. Favorite Disney character? Favorite Disney character? Yeah. Uh, Tiana. Who's that? Princess and the Frog. Oh, yep. Seen that one four times. Didn't, didn't remember the name. If you could uh, give all humans one virtue, what would you choose? Compassion. Three adjectives that you would, your family would use to describe you? <laughs> Judgy. <laughs> um... I think they would say it was funny, um, and uh, compassionate, but judgy first, <laughs> judgy always first. Glad I'm not the only one. <laughs> what was your grandmother's signature dish? My grandma's signature dish was biscuits, and it pains me because I can't eat gluten now. I've become gluten intolerant in my old age. And I have tried and tried and tried to sort of replicate biscuits. It just doesn't work. With or without gravy? With gravy. Okay. How do you define success? I define success as having joy in your life. I mean, if you, if you can look at your life and find joy in it, that is the ultimate success. What would you try if you had no fear? 
If I had no fear? Yep. Oh, I would try. One of the standing committee members, Jan Pearson, did like backcountry skiing where you jump out of the helicopter and you go down. I, I'm too scared for that. <laughs> Favorite app? Favorite app? Yeah. Um, I would say my favorite app is probably my Bible Gateway app. I know that's geeky, but it, it really is. It like, ding, at uh, 7.30 in the morning, here is your Bible verse for the day. I mean, it, it just does it for me. I love it. <laughs> hey, that's why we're asking. <laughs> Who's the funniest clergy you know? And this was submitted by Adam, so I think he means besides me. Uh, <laughs> other. <laughs> the funniest, funniest clergy, clergy you know. Alive or... That, that's up to you. It doesn't, doesn't specify. Oh, gosh. So one of the funniest clergy people I ever met was uh, the uh, blessed uh, Barbara Clementine Harris and, uh, of Harris of, of great memory. Uh, she was just hilarious. And she was so deadpan about everything. She just cracked me up. She was one of those people who wasn't She was somewhat um, sort of dismissive of kind of sort of like clergy politeness, you know, but she was just hilarious and, and in a way that she didn't take, she took the gospel very seriously, but not much else. Mm -hmm. She uh, preached the retirement of the clergy at the last church I served, and um, when she was coming out, I said, Bishop, do you want your mitre? And she said, and it's her smoker's voice. Um, oh no, if I wear that too long, my head expands into it. <laughs> <laughs> Is science or art more essential to humanity? You gave us a little glimpse of this in your sermon today. Oh. See, and I don't think it's an either or. I think it is a beautiful thing. One of my favorite things right, right now um, on my Facebook page, I've, I've connected with a new uh, web telescope. Mm -hmm. And just looking at the stars and the universe is so beautiful. I mean, it's, it's like artists sort of like try to recreate that in everything they do, and our creator has created it for us. Um, and so I think there's just this richness um, in, in, the, in the life of, of, of scientific inquiry and this life of, of artistic expression. I think those are all sort of places that call us into relationship with God mm -hmm. and that which is holy. So. Strangest thing you've ever eaten? Strangest thing? Yep. Have you been to the fort in Morrison, by the way? What? The fort in Morrison. I have not. I can't recommend, recommend it as a vegetarian, but you can get lots of weird stuff there. Um, Gosh, the strangest thing. Um... I think the most unique thing I've ever eaten is alligator. It's okay. It's not my favorite. Was it a lie? No. Okay. It was on a kebab. <laughs> and is justice or forgiveness more important? You know, I love, I have, I, my friend Rob Wright, he, he, I love him. He has like lots of pithy sayings. He's like, you know, the great thing about God is that God's thoughts and God's words and God's actions are all the same thing. Um, so that God's justice is God's forgiveness. God's mercy is God's love. Is God's justice is God being in relationship. And I think in a lot of ways, I, I talk about, you know, people are like, well, you know, we get justice. I was like, I don't know in this world we can actually have justice. We can have accountability. Um, I, I think it, it, it's going to take an eschaton for us to, to get real justice in the world. But doesn't mean we don't strive for it. We strive for it always. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank for you all. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Would you mind sending us out with just a quick prayer or and or blessing? Sure. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for this time. Thank you for the ability to gather as your people. We ask that you keep our minds open to see your work in the world about us. We ask, we ask that you keep our hearts soft, that we might love 
and share your compassion with the world. For everything that concerns us, Lord, we place that in your hand. Every need we have, we trust that you will supply. Pour out your spirit upon us that we might serve you faithfully, being reconcilers and healers in this broken world, creating your kingdom here with your help through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you.